Hello and welcome back. The covers are off and my Achilles is recovering well. I'd like to give a big thank you for all of the kind comments left on my previous video. A few months ago, I got a Unimat SL Mini Lathe. I've spent some time during my recovery cleaning it and upgrading several of its features. It's got a new motor, a variable speed drive, a digital tachometer, more chucks, face plates and an improved tooling system. But it didn't start out like this. When I got the lay that gave the appearance that it had been in storage and not run for several years, it also had some major corrosion on the bed rails. This video does not focus on the dismantle and cleaning. There are many videos of that on YouTube. Sites like the Adventures with a Very Small Lathe and the Knackler's Workshop have both covered this topic very well. This video series will cover the changes and upgrades that have made significant improvements to this small machine. G'day, I'm Steve-O and welcome to the Outback Shed. As best as I can ascertain, the lathe was built sometime in the mid-1960s. It has a centre height of just under 36mm and a capacity between centres of 160mm. It has a 95 watt motor with an inline start switch mounted into the power cable. The spindle bearings seem quiet but the bearings in the motor are worn and noisy. They appear to be bushes and could be easily replaced. However I decided to replace the motor so that won't be necessary. But I'll keep the original spindle bearings for now. After dismantling the lathe, it looks to be in good condition. The lead screws look ok with no real visible wear. The cross feed rails are dirty but usable, however the bed rails are corroded beyond recovery. So I'll replace them with 304 stainless steel ground bar. I didn't film on that day for some reason, but it was a straightforward operation to cut them to size, face and chamfer the ends, and use the mill to drill and counterbore the mounting holes. The DRO was invaluable to obtain the mounting hole spacing. The 55mm 3 jaw chuck that came with the lathe is a bit stiff to operate, but these are easily pulled apart and cleaned. They are only held together by a circlip and three screws. I cleaned up the parts in an ultrasonic cleaner. I filled the tank half full and then put some parts in the Pyrex dish, then filled that with hot water. This saves on concentrate and keeps the tank clean. It's the first time I've used it and I'd have to say I'm impressed. I'm using parts washer concentrate as a detergent and I'll put a link to this in the description. I've read that the original motor is prone to overheating and has a low duty cycle. It is also underpowered, so I chose a 200 watt 24 volt motor from Motion Dynamics to replace it. This has a flange mount that will be easy to fit using a custom made mounting plate. As you can see there are plenty of power options to choose from, but the 200 watt 24 volt motor is my choice. The same company offers most of the other components needed. I would like to have a variable speed controller and again there are several choices. I picked one that would handle 25 amps which would be more than adequate and it came mounted in a case. There is a lot of technical information on this website for those who are electrically inclined, including wiring diagrams. I had a conversation with Shane at Motion Dynamics and he told me that I would need a snubber, so I added that to the list. I'm not an electrician, so his advice was greatly appreciated. As the motor is 24 volts, I need a means of stepping down from the 240 volt local supply. 
I've found Power Supplies Australia and they are the importers for Meanwell Enclosed Power Supplies. I visited them and they recommended to use a 500 watt unit to cover the needs of a 200 watt motor. I got the RSP500. Big shout out to Ross for his help and advice. Their website also contains a lot of technical information on their products. I decided to install an e-stop as I reckon that will be good to have. I picked one up from a local supplier. It wasn't expensive and only cost around $80. I will need an enclosure for the power supply and to mount the switches and other items. I got this from the same supplier and it cost $40. I already had a digital tachometer that I want to fit. I think from memory I paid around $20 for it. It's a 24 volt unit so it will run off the same power supply. It came complete with a wiring loom and a sensor probe with a magnet. I cut a section of aluminium off a previously machined NT30 tooling holder which I no longer use. I machine it to size in the mill before facing it in the Colchester. One side has a relief to fit the motor flange and the other side has a stub to locate on the aluminium pulley phone on the back of the load. I machined the stub 12mm off centre to allow for additional clearance to the lathe as the new motor is quite a bit bigger in diameter than the original one. I mounted the power supply to a piece of plywood and screwed it to the enclosure base. The speed controller has exposed terminals so I machined the back out of a small plastic box to cover them. A look around the enclosure shows the power input, e-stop, speed controller, a forward reverse switch underneath it, and a start-stop switch, which I already had, and of course a tachometer. There is one spare double pole double throw switch, which could be used for a future opportunity. 
Because the original motor ran at 4000 RPM and the new one runs at 3200, some changes to pulley sizes may be needed. The current configuration is a three-piece pulley system. The speed tables show possible speed variations from 365 to 6000 RPM and with the addition of another step pulley set, 155 and 300 RPM are achievable. Because I have a speed control well, less pulleys may be needed. It currently has V pulleys, but they don't seem to compare to standard sizes. Also, every Unimat lathe I've seen uses round belts. The top of the V is 4mm and the depth is 3.2. That's close to a 2LV belt, but it's not quite the same. I plan to use a circular drive belt that I will make to suit, but for now I'll make new pulleys with a V configuration to match the existing spindle pulleys. Using the measurements I have, I can calculate the angle as shown in the drawing. 17.5 degrees will be close enough at this time. Once I have used the lathe and got a feel to determine the best speed ranges, I'll make a four step set with a semicircular groove to better fit the circular belt. With a step pulley setup, we want one belt to fit each speed choice. This means that the circumference over the pulleys must be the same with the pulleys at the same centres to maintain the belt tension. I've found two ways of sizing pulley sets to suit. The top drawing shows two equal pulley sets of 40, 60 and 80 millimetres, which are not drawn to scale, but the circles are equal sized. If a line is drawn tangentially to represent a belt between each driver and driven pulley, we can see that the lines intersect at the same point. This means that the same belt will tension each of the pulley choices. However, the line representing a potential 20mm pulley on this set does not meet at the same point, meaning that this size combination would not work in this setup. The lower drawing shows the actual driven pulley sizes. There may be somewhere in the driven pulley as 65mm makes more sense than 64 and 75 makes more sense than 74. However, when adding the driver and driven pulley sizes together, they are all equal. 104 and 105 millimetres, one millimetre notwithstanding. This method is the easiest as you don't need to make an accurate drawing to get the pulley sizes. Simply choose one set and the others are easily calculated. It's also possible to use this information to calculate the output speed of the driven shaft, but I'll show that in a future video when I make a new drive setup. Using an old vernier, I'll mark up a 3 16 high speed steel tool bit. Setting up on the tool and cutter grinder, I've set the angle to 17.5 degrees with a 5 degree clearance angle. I'm using a diamond wheel, but a white aluminium oxide wheel would do the job just as well. For the front clearance angle, I'm running the wheel in reverse to avoid the possibility of a dig-in. On an aluminium oxide wheel, that could produce a disastrous wheel explosion, so the direction of rotation is important. After a few strokes with an oil stone, the edges look fine.
The small pulley set has sizes of 20, 30 and 40 millimeters. 20 millimeters is the smallest pulley I can reasonably make as the bore is 10 millimeters. So with a 3.2 millimeter depth of cut, it doesn't leave much metal between the bottom of the V and the pulley bore. Setting up in the mill, I'll find the center and bore and tap a 6mm hole to take a grub screw to pick up on the drive of the motor's D-shaft. I'll start out with a 6mm end mill to create a flat surface for the 5mm tap drill. Yep, that's finished fine. The large pulley set follows the same process. I'm using a new T and GG insert which I got from Live Tools. Big shout out to Alpha. It's producing a nice finish.
I'm cutting the V by side shifting the cutter to reduce the cutting load on the tool bit. This helps in bringing it to size. After drilling, the bore is finished with a 10mm reamer. It's now a simple matter of parting off and then back to the mill to bore and tap another hole for a grub screw. The original pulley setup had three step pulleys. I'm only going to use two, a driver and a driven, which means I can now use the idler hole for mounting for the tachometer sensor. I'll machine a 19mm stub shaft with an 8mm threaded hole. Then I'll make a small bracket to hold the sensor.
I'll need to make a new nut for the driven pulley with a hole drilled partially through the end to retain the magnet, which I'll hold in place with a few drops of resin. It's important to note the polarity of the magnet as it will only work one way. A test run shows the lathe running. Well, that's it for this video. In the next part, I'll mount some new chucks, make some face plates and glue chucks, and I'll make some new tool pods to take larger tooling. I'll also do some test cuts. As always, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the build and found it of value. If so, please consider subscribing if you haven't already, and give it the thumbs up. Be productive, be creative, but most importantly, be safe in your shed. I'll catch you next time.